Texas Lutheran University. Good morning again and welcome everyone to the opening of our 2014 Crow Symposium. I am Tim Barr, director of the John and Sandra Moline Center for Servant Leadership and chair of our planning committee. To be consistent with our theme of care for the earth, we have chosen as a committee to video conference our first uh, few presenters. And so uh, these presenters are speaking to us from out of the state of Texas. Uh, this morning we are pleased to welcome the Reverend Dr. Leah Shade who is the pastor of United in Christ Lutheran Church in rural Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. She is the founder of the Interfaith Sacred Earth Coalition of the Susquehanna Valley, a coalition which seeks to protect creation and public health in the face of environmental devastation while promoting the use of non-fossil fuel energy sources and interfaith dialogue for the great work of this age. Reverend Shade completed her dissertation on preaching and ecological theology and received her PhD from the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia this, uh, this, actually this year, uh, this past May. She recently served on the Bipartisan Task Force on Hydraulic Fracturing for the Upper Susquehanna Synod of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and co-authored a resolution calling for the repeal of the fracking loopholes exempting shale gas and oil drilling from the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and Safe Drinking Water Act. That resolution was approved by the 2014 Synod Assembly. Reverend Shade recently began teaching a course in ethics as an adjunct instructor in philosophy at Lebanon Valley College. So uh, just to double check, Reverend Shade, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Reverend uh, Dr. Leah Shade to the Chapel of the Abiding Presence. Thank you again for inviting me to speak with you about environmental justice. Because of my work as an activist, or fractivist as we're called, I'm going to use the issue of shale gas and oil extraction as a case study to show how the Christian ethical perspective bears upon this particular issue. I'm going to begin by comparing and contrasting our respective shale plays, as they're called, and make the case for why this is an issue that the church should address. Then I'm going to raise up some scriptural and theological frameworks within which to understand this issue. And I'll conclude by pulling back for a wider view of why we do this work of environmental justice and its implications for churches and people of faith. So let's orient ourselves here. Eagle Ford Shale and Marcellus Shale. There's about 1,700 miles between us, but we share many of the same issues. The new energy boom from shale gas and oil drilling is providing new jobs. Some landowners who have leased their land for drilling have come into significant financial windfalls. Some towns are soaking in the corporate gifts of the gas and oil companies sprucing up their little league fields, their hospitals, their community centers. And some of those same towns are seeing increased crime rates, especially against women. Once amicable neighbors are being pit against each other, disputing land and water use. Some landowners have been left with poisoned well water. And the lucrative jobs come with a cost. Broken families with workers away for weeks at a time severe health problems due to chemical exposure, and even death when explosions light up the sky. One difference between Texas and Pennsylvania, however, is the availability of water for the process of fracking. No town in Pennsylvania faces the situation that folks are dealing with in Barnhart, Texas, about 250 miles northwest of where you are, where the fight for water between municipal use farmers, ranchers, and the industry has come to a stalemate. The individuals who took a gamble in allowing the drill rigs on their land are in a no-win situation. The water is gone, the cattle has been sold off, 
and soon enough the royalties from the gas will be gone too. Granted, Barnhart has always faced water shortages because it's in a desertified region of the state. It's not the gas industry's fault, is it? And it's not their fault that Texas is in the midst of a years-long drought, is it? Or is there a connection? Water issues aside, the contributions of methane gas to the climate crisis are steadily increasing and very worrisome. According to Harvard professor Naomi Oreskes, who teaches history of science and earth and planetary sciences, life cycle emissions from natural gas production are setting us up for disastrous global warming over the next several decades. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimated that global warming potential, GWP, for methane is 34 times that of CO2 over the span of 100 years. However, when the time frame is changed to 20 years, the GWP increases to over 70. And given the disruptions that are already occurring, such as ice sheets melting, hurricanes intensifying, and droughts increasing, the 20-year time frame is the one that has to be our foremost concern. But does it have to be the church's concern? That's what a few respondents asked in their answers to our task force's questionnaire on shale gas drilling. They questioned why the church is addressing shale gas and oil drilling and its related processes. Does this issue warrant the church's attention? Well, to answer that, we have to first establish what the criteria is. In the Lutheran Church, there are two authorities that determine who we are and what we do as a church body. One is the Bible. The other is Lutheran theology, as set out in our founding documents during the Reformation and in the church's ongoing discernment through its social policy statements. Briefly, the Bible asserts that God created heaven and earth and everything therein and pro proclaimed it good. And God has entrusted humankind to the care of the earth. Building on that, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has adopted social policy statements. One is called Caring for Creation in 1993, and the other is Sufficient and Sustainable Livelihood in 1999 that call for economic and environmental justice to protect the health and integrity of creation both for its own sake and for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations and for economic justice to consider how our actions affect the ability of all people to provide for their material needs and the needs of their families and communities. Our task force made the case that shale gas and oil drilling and its related processes and industries touch on several aspects of economic and environmental justice. The economic boom associated with shale gas and oil has led to the use of a new term, shaleionaires. And has anybody ever heard of that term, shaleionaires? They talked about that on 60 Minutes. It's when farmers or landowners who may have been at a subsistence level are now coming into being the economic elite. The full economic impact is like the proverbial rising tide that lifts all boats, helping to fuel a boom in businesses, in restaurants, hotels, real estate, lawyers, and many aspects of the local economy. Vehicle dealers, mechanics, construction contractors, are saying that they are enjoying the ripple effects of the industry. But like all human endeavors, hydraulic fracturing has both positive and negative impacts on people and God's creation. There are many facts and opinions, both positive and negative, regarding the way people are affected by the industry now and will be in the future. Regarding the human, social, and environmental impacts, there is some agreement and some disagreement. The economics of shale gas and oil extraction, private land leasing, public land use, 
pipelines and transportation, compressor stations, liquefied nat natural gas facilities, domestic energy, and international gas exports all involve vast amounts of money and the exercise of power at an individual, corporate, and government level. The safety and integrity of those natural resources created by God, such as the water, air, land, fields, and ecosystems held in the common trust are impacted by the shale gas and oil industry. Articles and scientific studies examined by our task force show that public health and safety of individuals and communities are affected by the use of known toxins and carcinogens in fracking fluids, radioactive material and dissolved solids in flowback water, earthquakes that have been reported, compressor station and train explosions, tank and pipeline leaks, and illegal disposal of wastewater have all been reported, all of which pose significant threats to plant, animal, and human life, particularly to women, pregnant women, fetuses, infants, and children. At the same time, the ever-growing energy demands of our country and the world have placed shale gas and oil drilling at the forefront of energy extraction. The technique of modern-day slick water horizontal hydraulic fracturing is a recent industrial development less than 20 years old. Hydrofracking began in Pennsylvania around 2007. Does anybody know when it began in Texas? About in the early 1990s in the Barnett Shale in the north part of Texas. The speed at which shale gas and oil drilling has spread across the United States and the rate at which related industry and infrastructure has developed lends urgency to a civil conversation among all peoples of faith and all of our society to address this issue. The ELCA and its predecessor bodies have a long-standing and honorable history of engaging politically charged issues, routinely proclaiming a public theology that takes seriously Jesus' call to care for the least of these, and his model of engaging publicly those who control power and wealth in society. With so much at stake and so many lives and communities at stake, impacted by shale gas and oil drilling, it is imperative that the church engage these topics and take part in dialogues so that the moral and ethical questions are brought to bear on this practice. And so I ask today, where would Jesus frack? There are a number of texts from Scripture, Luther's writings, and the church's social statements that are pertinent to this question. Of course, none of these texts refer to the industry itself, but they do raise questions and concerns that Christians and all people of faith and concern can rightly discuss. Specifically, these texts touch on issues of stewardship, resource conservation, and social justice. According to the ELCA social statement, Caring for Creation, humans in service to God have special roles on behalf of the whole creation. Made in the image of God, we are called to care for the earth as God cares for the earth. God's command to have dominion and subdue the earth is not a license to dominate and exploit. Human dominion, a special responsibility, should reflect God's way of ruling as a shepherd king who takes the form of a servant wearing a crown of thorns. According to Genesis 2.15, our role within creation is to serve and to keep God's garden the earth. To serve, often translated to till, invites us again to envision ourselves as servants, while to keep invites us to take care of the earth as God keeps and cares for us. It follows then that we are to assume a position of humility and service in our attitude toward God's creation and the human community. There are numerous Old Testament, Old Testament texts that have a bearing on our conversations about this industry, 
and I would be happy to share our Bible study that we put together and our task force. But in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on just the commandment to forego idolatry and honor God found in Exodus. With those commandments in mind, the questions we might raise are, in what ways has the shale gas and oil industry been advertised as the answer to our energy and economic problems? And should we accept this campaign uncritically without considering the long-range impacts and potential for ecological damage? Another question would be, in what way has the fossil fuel industry taken on godlike status within our contemporary society? The prophetic tradition, too, can offer guidance regarding ethical questions surrounding economic and natural resources. Micah 6.8 urges us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God, which provides a mandate for raising awareness about injustice, speaking truth to power, advocating for those most vulnerable, and calling for repentance, justice, and righteousness. Jesus' teachings in the Gospel and the writings of the New Testament also have a bearing on our conversations. Again, while they certainly do not directly address this modern-day industrial extraction process, There are some things within the New Testament that provide a lens for us to approach approach this contemporary issue. For example, Jesus' injunction to care for the least of these in Matthew 25. This has implications and ramifications for impoverished rural families and communities, the health of the unborn, children, women, and men, and the lives and health of all Earth's living beings flora, fauna, fish. One question we should ask is, why has our current economic system allowed rural families and communities to fall into such financial instability that they would consider allowing an extraction process that carries so much risk? New Testament teachings on wealth have implications for the economic boom cycle of the shale gas and oil drilling. Paul writes to Timothy, Those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. That's from 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6-10. We should also ask how we might apply Paul's words about resisting what he calls the powers and principalities in Ephesians chapter 6, which are those unseen forces with more than human power to influence and tempt us in negative ways. So in what ways can we confront political and global corporate systems that have little accountability and oversight, and they have hidden controls over the wealth and information dispersal at a global level. The ELCA social statement, Caring for Creation, offers the following observation. Alienated from God and creation and driven to make a name for ourselves, we become captive to demonic powers and unjust institutions. In our captivity, we treat the earth as a boundless warehouse and allow the powerful to exploit its bounties to its own ends. Our sin and captivity lie at the roots of the current crisis. Another story from the Gospels that has interesting implications for the process of fracking and its water use is the narrative about the Samaritan woman. The woman at the well, she is an outcast. among the least of these, without protection within a patriarchal system of domination. Jesus offers her living water, along with the recognition of her personhood, dignity, and reconnection with her community. 
Relating this story to the contemporary issue of shale gas and oil drilling, those who bear the brunt of suffering from hydraulic fracturing are often women who struggle to care for their families when their water has been compromised by the fracking process. As evidenced by the growing number of complaints filed and cases of water contamination, the concern is that families are offered little to no protection within the current system of governance and corporate decision making. So how can the church offer living water to those who are suffering, along with the recognition of their rights, dignity, and restoration of their health and community? At the same time, how can we protect the actual living water of creation from the processes of fracking that happen through human error or through deliberate violation or just simply in the process itself? Now, moving to Lutheran theology, Luther's teaching on the sacraments remind us how important it is to preserve the sanctity of those elements of creation. God's word is made visible in water, bread, and wine, and they are essential for holy baptism and holy communion. As Lutheran Christians, we are called to take this reality into consideration when addressing the complexities of any human energy extraction process that affects those elements. For example, I will often ask, should we baptize someone in fracked water? In addition, Luther's teaching on the law gives us a basis for understanding how it can be applied to the modern process of shale gas and oil extraction and its related industries. And here I just want to pull over... uh, There you go. I want to read something from the formula of Concord, but I want you to be able to see uh, the, 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 the basic principles that he lays out here. He says, The law is, has been given to people for three reasons. First, that through it, external discipline may be maintained against the unruly and the disobedient. Second, that people may be led through it to a recognition of their sins. Third, after they have been reborn, since nevertheless the sins of the flesh cling to them, that precisely because of the flesh, they may have a sure guide according to which they can orient and conduct their lives. So, three uses. External discipline, the mirror to recognize our sin, and for order and conduct guided by God. The law then could be said to provide for justice in relationships that lead to honoring the integrity of creation and striving for fairness within the human community, in the words of Caring for Creation. With this in mind, we can invoke this teaching on the law and apply it to this environmental issue of shale gas and oil extraction. First of all, by calling for all entities, individual, corporate, governmental, and community, to restrain against those practices and human laws that bring harm to God's creation and the human community. And that's how we came up with closing the Halliburton loopholes, to restrain against those practices that are unfair and unjust. The second use is to hold a mirror up to our own economic and material concupiscence and the reality of the ways in which we individually and communally are curved in among ourselves. In other words, thinking only of our own desire for cheap energy that results in harming environmental and human health, or thinking of our desire for the accumulation of wealth and comfort at the expense of others and God's creation. And three, to guide us to make decisions within a robust context of moral deliberation about how we are to live, heat our homes, transport ourselves and our goods, and power our energy needs. So returning again to my original question, where would Jesus frack? 
We must certainly be careful that we do not overstep our bounds in making assumptions about what Jesus would say regarding this modern process. I do not doubt that Jesus would take it upon himself to travel into one of those work camps next to the drilling rig and mingle with the workers, break bread with them, minister to them, pray with them, much to the dismay of those who might see those workers as the equivalent of tax collectors of our time. But I can only hope that upon their encounter with the living God, they would climb down from those towering rigs, like Zacchaeus from the sycamore tree, inspired to reform their livelihoods and give back what they have taken. But when it comes to confronting those in power who exercise control over people, Jesus never minces words. He says in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve both God and wealth. A teaching that is found within a chapter that also addresses the dangers of storing up perishable wealth and worrying about physical needs. It follows then that we must raise questions about the lures of easy money that come from the shale gas and oil boom. At the same time, we must raise ethics, we must raise concern about the ethics of individuals and corporations profiting so handsomely when God's creation and others in society are suffering as a result. The industry has taken a huge risk in painting itself as clean, safe American energy that is the salvation for all of our woes, while ignoring, dismissing, or silencing those who have suffered in its wake. Like the gleaming statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, whose iron feet were mixed with clay, there appears to be a fatal flaw in the very foundation upon which this industry is built. Like Goliath of old, the giant will eventually collapse under its own weight when the right stone finds its mark. Biblical stories like these remind us that those who think themselves invincible to the laws of God and creation will eventually find themselves toppled and collapsed. This is where I believe we can speak a word of hope, empowerment, and courage to those who resist the powers that seek to dominate them. At the same time, through ministry that incorporates environmental justice, congregations can begin to see how their ministry can, in a very contextual way, bring Jesus to meet those women at the well, speaking for and with both earth and those who are oppressed in a ministry of reconciliation and resistance to injustice. This ministry also has a word to say to the powers and principalities and the society that exists beyond the church walls. It is a word that puts the systems of domination and those they hold in thrall on notice, that the crucifixions they perpetrate will not be the final word nor will their oppressive reign endure without resistance. Like the women going to the tomb on Easter morning who wonder, who will roll this stone away? Who know nothing at that point other than defeat and death, but who make the journey to the tomb out of their love and faithfulness. We too must walk to the tombs of our crucified earth today including the lands, waters, and ecosystems that have been destroyed by fracking or mountaintop removal or slash-and-burn monoculture or any other human endeavor. I have to admit it can be depressing to take up this work, to attend to the woundedness and the evil that afflicts God's creation and those who suffer among it. But the women at the tomb provide us a beautiful model of how we can do this work. They did not go thinking that they could save Jesus. They went 
because that is what they were called to do. Likewise, we do not do this work thinking that we can save the earth. We do this work of environmental justice because this is what we are called to do. We are not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful. And I have great faith that we will arrive at the tomb on Easter morning surprised by Easter joy. Thank you. We just heard and now the I believe we're, we're going to do question and answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. We just heard the, the chapel bell ring here so that we know, uh, we know we have about 20 minutes uh, for question and dialogue. I uh, encourage you uh, to uh, engage in this with respect for one another, uh, with respect for our, our presenter, and um, to ask questions, please. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll take time to do that, and the microphone here in the front is set up, so if you have a question, please come forward and, and ask. Dr. Shade, I'm Annette Sitzler. I teach uh, an environmental justice course this semester. I'm a business and economics professor um, teaching with uh, my dear colleague, Phil Ruge jones um, He's a theologian uh, on campus, and the question that I have really relates more to his area, which I'm often encroaching into, I'm afraid. But I was intrigued by your um, contrast between the blue and the red, um, especially because of what I believe is the church's critical role in um, creating ground for moral deliberation. And I was especially struck by uh, this blending of these two colors into the purple. And uh, for me, the purple in the liturgical use in our church is the Lenten <laughs> color, which is sort of a time of penance and suffering and all of that sort of thing. And I wish you would say a little bit about um, the, the struggle and the suffering and so on that we go through um, emotionally when we put ourselves at risk doing this kind of moral deliberation. Um, whether it's a political issue or an environmental issue, just say a little bit more about that and where do you draw um, the strength from when you're trying to engage in that kind of process, not just with people in the church who sit in the pews with you, but with people from other faith traditions or from no faith background. Can you just speak a little bit to that about the purpleness of that? Sure. Thank you, Annette. That's a, that's a great observation. And uh, to answer that question, I want to share with you an experience I had at uh, the Riverdale Mobile Home Park in, um, near Williamsport in Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania. This was uh, a mobile home park of about 32 low-income families uh, many of them uh, were disabled, many of them working multiple jobs just to make ends meet. And uh, a corporation called Aqua America bought the land upon which their trailers stood for about 40 years. They bought the land, let's see, this would have been about two years ago, and they forcibly evicted all of the residents to make room for a water withdrawal plant to sell water from the Susquehanna River to the fracking industry. I was uh, alerted to this and I was asked as a pastor living about 30 minutes south to go to the people, listen to their stories. I took prayer shawls up to them to find out um, would, were they welcoming this move? Were they distressed by it? And uh, it turns out that some people were um, thinking that, well, I, I, I'm happy to get the $1,500 that they're offering and I'm going to leave. But there were other people with uh, mobile homes that could not be moved. It usually costs about $10,000 to move a mobile home and all of the, the things that have to be done. And the, the cost of 
trying to rent an apartment in Williamsport has gone skyrocketing because of the workers coming in for the industry. So no one could barely afford to do this. So uh, a lot of the activists in the area worked with these residents and tried to work with Aqua America to say, could you go to a different spot? There's, a, there's plenty of other places along the Susquehanna that you could go to to build this plant. Why are you targeting these low-income people who have no political clout or power and, and forcibly removing them? And um, basically all they said was, well, we'll give them an extra 30 days and uh, an extra $1,000. This was incredibly unsatisfactory. And so what we decided to do was on the day before the bulldozers were to come in to this mobile home park, we held a, an interfaith vigil and we lamented with the residents the loss of their homes. And I'm just going to show you a slide. You can see here we lit candles for all of the families that were being evicted. We read things from the Quran, from uh, the Hebrew scripture, from the New Testament. We read things from Buddhism. We read things from Native American traditions. And we had prayer. And, the, and it was a, an incredibly sad but unifying experience. Now the next day, I went back to the mobile home park and I found, you see the picture up at the top where it says, uh, uh, this place is beautiful, people live here. They had set up a barricade using all of the, uh, the left behind materials from the stripped mobile homes and they built barriers and, and set up a whole blockade to keep the bulldozers from coming in. The residents actually asked the activists to stay there, to be in solidarity with them, and they set up, they called it Occupy Riverdale, and they set up tents, and they had this little democratic community, and they helped each other, and I brought up supplies from my church, and we prayed, and we, you know, it was just an amazing experience. They held out for 12 days. But on the 12th day, the company called in a private security firm from Philadelphia, which these residents happened to be white, and it just so happened that the security firm, the, were, they were African American, and they also called in the state police, and they descended upon the activists, and they were about to arrest all of them, but the residents asked the activists to please stand down because they didn't want to see them get arrested. And so, peacefully, the activists dispersed. But I have to tell you that what I saw the day after that lamenting prayer service was, it was like a trickster community of resurrection to see this devastated mobile home park all of a sudden alive with activity and hope and, and the children that live there, um, you know, people bringing guitars and singing with them, and they made huge posters with paint, and they put their hands on them, and they wrote farmer, veteran, truck driver, and they put up these huge signs on the barricade. And, and, and so it gave me hope that the children there saw that what was happening to them was not going unresisted, that we were lamenting with them, we were standing in solidarity with them, and then even now that, the, that there has been a, a diaspora of Riverdale, um, that we still, I'm in communication with some of them, checking in with them, giving them help sometimes from my pastor's discretionary fund, that sort of thing. So that's just a, a, an example of the kind of painful work that we have to do when we go to those places and we minister to people across the ideological lines. I mean, the people in these mobile home parks, they were certainly not flaming green environmentalists like myself, but we all had the, the common ethical orientation of destroying people's homes and the river and this community is not right. 
And so that was a, a, a wonderful example for me of how people can come together in a purple zone to call for justice. I hope that answers your question, Annette. Thank you so much for your message. Um, I wish my cousin, who is a minister, um, like you, on a different church, were here to hear it. Um, and I'm trying to, again, bring together that the issues of people of different faiths and um, you know, all faiths, I guess, uh, including those that really recognize the earth and people as and as, as inseparable from what God is, I guess. And I just wanted to, I've worked with environmental justice issues, both with communities and in an academic sense for about 25 years. Um, and here in Texas, we have, in South and Central Texas, we have a strong tradition that's um, been going, and that's part of what we're looking at in this. And I just wanted to mention in terms of the fra fracking, which you, uh, recognize as something that has come along pretty recently. Um, what my work has been has been looking at the cultural poetics, which I think is what you just talked about in terms of the lamenting ceremony and, and several other uh, situations. Um, I work with a group called the Esperanza Center for Peace and Justice in San Antonio, and we just completed on the 31st of August a uh, exhibit that looks an exhibit that looks at at fracking. Um, we were focusing on Eagle Ford Shale, but had uh, people exhibit work from all over, including some from Pennsylvania, I think. Um, and I wanted to know if you could talk about some of the other um, points of hope that come from that cultural poetics that people um, from all over present as a means of resistance. Thank you. Sure, that's a great question. I've got two examples to answer that question. One has to do, again, with um, fracking and the sanctity of water, and then another one has to do with uh, an issue that I was involved with around a tire burner. So let me start with, first of all, the, um, the, the community coming together around the sanctity of water. This Interfaith Sacred Earth Coalition that Tim mentioned that I'm the founder of, in, uh, a couple years ago, Pennsylvania passed an act called Act 13 that gave the industry incredible licensure to basically do whatever they wanted um, and, and just kick the door wide open for the industry to come in. And in response to that, we gathered a number of people from different faiths, and we went to a place on the Susquehanna River, and um, I don't have any pictures of this, but the way the Susquehanna River is, there's a, a north branch and a west branch, and they come together at a place called Shikalimi Point, and it's an incredibly beautiful spot where you can see both of these confluences coming together. And so we gathered there in, in February. It was a, a bitterly cold winter day, but it was just after Act 13 had passed. And we gathered there at the river, and we had uh, basins of water taken from the river. And we had people, we had a Unitarian, we had uh, a rabbi, we had Catholic, we had uh, Protestant, we had Native American, we had New Age spiritualities, all represented, and we um, gave opportunities for people to bless the water in their own tradition. And um, of course, had speeches, and the media was there, that sort of thing. And then what was all over, we poured all of the water into one basin, and then poured that basin back into the Susquehanna River. And it was just, uh, it gave me chills, not just because it was 32 degrees, but it was just a really wonderful experience. And I have to say, too, um, I took some of this water 
to um, a meeting of the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. And I told them what we had done with this water. And the Susquehanna River Basin Commission are the ones that give the permits for the fracking industry to, for their water use. And it just so happened that the, they gave the permit to Aqua America that eventually led to the destruction of Riverdale. I did not know this at the time I had gone to this meeting. I didn't find out about Riverdale until a couple months later. But I took this basin of water to, with me to the, to the hearing, to the testimony. And I told them what we had done. And I presented this basin to them as a gift and gave my speech. And, and the, one, the, the guy who was the head of it looked at me and he said, well, what are we supposed to do with this? And I said, I trust that you will handle this water the way you will handle the water of, us, of our Susquehanna River. I can only guess that it was probably poured into a sink or a toilet because they approved nearly all of the water withdrawal permits for the fracking industry. So the way they handled that water was sadly and poetically the way they handled the water of our Susquehanna River. Um, now, speaking to a more positive situation, I was uh, involved with a community grassroots org, uh, effort to oppose a proposed tire incinerator for my area here in central Pennsylvania. And this was another example of people coming from all different walks of life and meeting together and forming committees to do publicity and fundraising and um, doing all kinds of events and, and uh, uh, lectures and community um, town hall meetings and letter writing campaigns and, and it was just an amazing effort. And this went on for about nine months and uh, it turned out through our efforts that the, the company that was giving the land for this tire incinerator to, to, be, to be placed pulled out of the deal. And they said in their press release that it was due in large part to the efforts of the community saying that we did not want this in our backyard, so to speak, or really any place for that matter. And of course there were lots of debates about, well, it's going to bring jobs and it's going to be good for our economy. But again, those of us who were came together for the tire burner team, um, we had professors, we had atheists, we had grandparents, we had, uh, again, tree-hugging liberals, and we had uh, bright red conservatives coming together on this issue, and it created a sense of community identity that was just amazing to me. And, and so we defeated the tire burner, and uh, so that, it was nice to be involved with an effort that was actually successful. So uh, those are some examples of, of the kinds of things that you were asking about. We have about two minutes for a final uh, question and response. Uh, hi, my name is Sam Brannon. I work for the Texas Interfaith Center for Public Policy in Austin, Texas. And I'm glad I only have two minutes because I could, I could really use up more. Um, and the main thing that I'm curious about is the process uh, that your team came up with. Um, how did you put the team together, uh, if you go into a little bit more of that? And, um, and as you went through the process, how did you get from energy to water? And, um, and, and where do you keep the documentation of this process so I can research it completely? Yes. Great question, Sam. Uh, the process came about, it, it was initiated by, like I said in my talk, for, um, from a resolution that was put forth in our 2012 Senate Assembly. It was co-authored by myself and another pastor in, in our Synod, and it called for um, three things. It called for the establishment of a task group to explore the justice issues surrounding the fracking industry, it called for a memorial to the ELCA churchwide assembly. Um, and then the third thing it did was it called for a moratorium on all drilling until studies could be completed and it could be ensured that it was safe. Now, that I'm saying it very simplified. The, the resolution was much more complex. And the way it worked was 
if they had to vote for the first one in order for the other two to even be considered. So like, if they, if they didn't even want to have a task force look at this, it would be no point to even address the other two. And they were all voted in by the assembly. And again, this was incredible to me because this is a very conservative area. And especially to have the moratorium resolution uh, voted in by assembly, that just floored me. So once this, uh, the, the assembly gave the go-ahead for this task force, it was up to the bishop to appoint the people on this committee, uh, this task force. And I think what he did was he, he looked at the people who stood at the microphone and debated each other on the floor and said, okay, you have this invested in it and you have a stake in this, how about you be part of the committee? So um, that's how uh, mostly people had come to be part of this committee. We had about eight people on the committee and he just did a great job of putting together a very diverse group. Um, and like I said, it was really hard to work together, um, but somehow we were able to, to muddle through it. And it's really only in hindsight that I can say, okay, this is the process we, this had never been done before by any of us, so we were kind of working our way through it, learning as we went along. The documentation is on the, the Upper Susquehanna Synod website, and if you're having trouble accessing that, I'm sure Tim can, uh, to, can give, in fact, I will put up my um, uh, contact information at the end here um, that has uh, a way for you to get a hold of me, my uh, email address and my cell phone number, and I'm happy to talk with anyone uh, beyond this time, this limited time we have here. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer that and, and to engage this topic further. Personally, I'm uh, deeply grateful uh, for Pastor Shade uh, telling us uh, the story of, of what she's been doing these last few years and, uh, and inspired. So I'd ask uh, that we show our appreciation uh, for her addressing us uh, this morning, both in chapel and in this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.